Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, and we're looking at um, Daniel's confession of his sin and the sin of his people that is going to lead up to a revelation given to him of some of the most fascinating prophecy to be found anywhere in the Word of God. Now, an interesting thing that has occurred to me is that when we get to the prophecy of the 70 weeks, if God blesses us to get there, I know we're kind of grinding through it slowly, we're going to find that what God prophesies to Daniel is the very essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of what he accomplished in his coming as our Savior. So it's very interesting that Daniel's confession leads up to that revelation of the gospel. And when you have the kind of mindset that Daniel had that's expressed in this confession, that's what prepares you for the gospel. And those are the people that really value it and appreciate it. The people that have Daniel's mindset with regard to their own personal sin and come clean with God like this, they are the ones that the gospel is for. And we'll see this as we walk through it. So last week we were looking at verses uh, 5 and 6 where Daniel had given a very detailed um, clear description of the sin of the people. This was his confession, and he didn't gloss anything over. We combed through that pretty thoroughly. But the confession is not stopped yet. There are more things that need to be confessed and acknowledged as we walk through. In these verses, we've confessed the sin. In verse 7, we're going to confess the righteousness of God in punishing the sin. In verse 8, we're going to confess the effect that sin has had upon us in terms of confusion and personal shame. And then in verse 9, we're going to confess God's forgiveness and God's mercies. And that's what Daniel is seeking. Well, let's start with verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. Now, all I want right now, well, let me go ahead and read the verse. But unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. Now, O Lord, quiet our hearts. Open our hearts to the word that thy servant doth bring to the clarity of thought and clarity of utterance to make plain that which thou hast revealed here and blessed me with understanding of. We ask in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. O Lord, righteousness belongeth to thee. In the following verses, Daniel confesses. He acknowledges the judgment that the Lord had brought upon Israel for their sins. If you go down to verse 11, Daniel says in verse 11, I want to look at the middle of the verse, therefore, Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath is, that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Then on down in verse 14, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. What Daniel is acknowledging here is that it was God it was God that was bringing this evil upon them, this punishment. The Lord was watching over it. He was overseeing the entire operation. So that he, he's crediting God with what they're suffering. The Lord did this to us. And yet, if you turn to Jeremiah 31, 28, we have an interesting note of uh, encouragement Coupled to, that can be coupled together with this acknowledgement that God had watched over them to bring all this evil upon them. And this is in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 28, where the Lord says through the prophet, and it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, and that's exactly what God had done to that nation. He had plucked them up out of their land, sent them into captivity, broke down their walls, threw down their temple, destroyed right and left with widespread destruction and great affliction. So God says, just like I watched over you to do that, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. So the Lord promised that just as he had watched over them for evil, 
he would also watch over them for good. And that's what's encouraging Daniel to pray this prayer. The Lord's promise to also watch over them to do them good. Now, as we read this confession, we find that the law of cause and effect was in full operation. The cause of what they were suffering was their sin. And that's exactly where Daniel lays it. And the effect was what they were suffering, the judgment of God. Cause, effect, sin, judgment, sin, judgment. One of the things when people come to me and say they want to get baptized and I analyze what they know, I want to see if they know sufficient of the gospel to be baptized. And they will always say to me, they will say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And I will always follow up the question with, okay, what is sin? You know, what does that mean? And then, of course, they define to me, when that uh, sin is uh, not doing what God says, breaking his commandments, which is correct. And then I follow it up and I say, well, why did Jesus have to die for our sins? Why was that? And I'm asking you that question. You ever ask yourself that question? I mean, we can all parrot Jesus died for our sins. What, why? Why did he have to do that? And it comes down to the fact that sin is deserving of punishment. God punishes sin because he is so holy he can't stand the contradiction of himself and his law he must punish it in faithfulness to himself he can't wink at it and let it go by because it's so contradictory to his very being he would not be who he is if he could wink at it and consider it a matter of no consequence he would not be the holy and righteous god that he is and that's why christ died he took our punishment for us and when i have kids come to me to make a confession, I'll say, it'd be like if you did something wrong and your brother said, I'll take your beating for you. That's the idea here. Punished for sin. Cause effect. So the point is, is that in this confession, hear me now, Daniel is admitting that they were not simply suffering misfortunes by chance. He did not lay their social ills to lack of education, to lack of government funding, or do anything like that. He laid it right down to their sin. That's why they were in the mess that they were in. And it was just not merely happenstance. Now, although the punishment had been severe, notice that Daniel acknowledged that God was righteous, perfectly within his rights to deal with them in the way that he had severe, though it had been. I mean, he said there in the verse that we're considering that very first thing, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. And I just read it to you down there in verse 14. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought us up upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we've not obeyed his voice. There is a parallel verse that could kind of be taken along with this over in Psalm 119 and verse 137. Psalm 119, 137 Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. You're perfectly within your rights to do what you're doing. Now, one of the things that we saw this morning, in fact, let's, let's, let's go down at verse 11. Let's start there. Because what I want to show you now is that in severely judging Israel for their sins, this, this point is, is extremely important, extremely important. In severely judging Israel for their sins, the righteous God was simply keeping his word and doing what he had sworn with an oath he would do. As bad as it was, and it was bad, if you want to get a glimpse of just what they had been suffering for 70 years, go read the five-chapter book of Lamentations and you'll get, a, you'll get a glimpse into it because Jeremiah was an eyewitness of it. He experienced it and he'll tell you about it and it was brutal. And it was severe. But it wasn't anything that God hadn't told them in advance would happen. Now let's look at verse 11. Because what we're doing here, we're actually making some time on this. By the time I get done with this section, why, my goodness, we'll be all the way down to verse uh, 13. <clears throat> Breakneck speed. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. I like that. Poured upon us. Just an outpouring of curse. And the oath. The oath was poured on them that is written in the law of Moses. And we're going to read that oath here in a moment. In the law of Moses, the servant of God. So God was doing what he'd sworn he would do. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us. And by bringing upon us a great evil, 
For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Now, this is quite a lengthy read, but if you want a Bible reading for this week, and people say it helps when I give them one. Read Deuteronomy 28. That's, you want to break it up maybe in pieces. It might be a little much for one sitting. But in Deuteronomy 28, you have a list of the curses. You have a list of the judgments that the law of Moses had said would come upon Israel if they disobeyed God's voice, which they did. And you can take that 28th chapter of Deuteronomy and you can pair it with what you read in the book of Lamentations where you had the eyewitness account of what they went through and you will see the correspondence between the judgments prophesied and the judgments experienced. And you will see that indeed God had confirmed his words and done to them exactly what he told them in advance he would do. Therefore, the nation of Israel was entirely without excuse because they had been told in advance, they had been clearly instructed of their duty and clearly warned of the consequences if they didn't do it. They could never say, well, oh my goodness, all this terrible stuff has happened. Well, we had no idea this would happen. Oh no, the prophets had risen up early, had been telling them for years. Jeremiah was sent specifically prior to its happening to warn them, and they turned him a deaf ear by and large. They were entirely without excuse. They went right against better knowledge. They just simply, plainly refused to believe what the preacher was telling them and what they were reading on the page of the book. Somehow they thought it didn't apply to them, and somehow they thought they could snake around and escape the consequences, and you never can. Give it up. You never can. You know why? Because if you can get away with it, God's a liar. Because God's sworn his vengeance against it. He will keep his word. Better bet that. You say, well, I think I'm getting along with it. Right? I, I just think just to be getting a buy with it. I mean, I'm living this double life and nobody's caught me yet. Wait till you die. That may be when you get caught. And that's not when you want to get caught. That's not when you want it to catch up with you, in other words. Not then. You be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers in are you bastards and not sons. But let, let's look at this oath. I looked at that and I said, okay, I've got Deuteronomy 28, I've got Leviticus 26, which describes in detail the judgments that would come on them if they didn't obey God's voice. But what's this pouring out the oath? Where's this oath bit? Well, I found it. And this is going to be our most lengthy reading this morning, but it's going to be necessary we walk through it and highlight a couple of things. And it's, it's, it's very, it, 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 it brings a warning to every one of us, not only as a congregation collectively, but to each of us individually. So I want to take you to Deuteronomy 29, because here's where we're going to read that oath that God poured out upon them that Daniel is referencing. Have you noticed how thoroughly scriptural Daniel's prayer is? I mean, he's just taking the word of God and is turning it into a prayer. We come to Deuteronomy 29, and we're going to read this oath, and we're going to start back up at verse 10. Like I said, it'll be a, bit, be a bit of a lengthy reading, but just I'll try to read it in a way that's interesting. I won't read it, Larry, like that strict Baptist preacher read the chapter. Yes, gone. This day, all of you, before the Lord, your God. That's where they read the chapter. Read a whole chapter. Pray 20 minutes like that. I've told the story before. Larry and I were sitting on the balcony with a nervous wreck. He kept jiggling his leg in the balcony. He was shaking. Oh, <laughs> Larry used to complain about me being too animated. I said, okay, Larry, take your pick. Me or that guy? He said, you. Oh, that was a trip. Deuteronomy 29.10, You stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God. And you know you are too. That's, this is God's house. We're before the Lord today, folks. You need to get that. Your captains of your tribes and your elders, of which we have several in here. <clears throat> Some people are slow. And your officers with all the men of Israel. Your little ones, we've got several of those and more on the way. Your wives and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath, there it is, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath. There's the oath that Daniel said was poured out. But with him that standeth here with us today, this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that's not here with us this day. This was a covenant and an oath that not only reached them, but the generations to follow, making it with them and their children to come. For you know how we dwelt in the land of Egypt and how we came through the nations which you passed by and have seen their abominations and their idols, wooden stones, silver and gold, which were among them. Now watch this. Lest there be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse. Now he's talking to the nation, but notice how he now brings it down to a single individual. This was applicable congregationally, but also individually. It was to every single person. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse and he bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of mine heart and add drunkenness to thirst. In other words, I'm just going to do whatever I want to and I'm going to go out and get plastered when I want to and in anything going to happen to me that's bad, I'm going to have peace even though I do it, I'm going to get away with it. Nobody will ever find out. And he says, the Lord will not spare him. And he said, and then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. You do not want God's anger smoking against you. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto all, unto evil, out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law, so that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you, and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, and the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? And what meaneth the heat of this great anger? And the men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God their fathers. Did you notice we went from the congregation to the individual? Now we're back to the congregation. Now just keep that thought in mind. Did you see that, trans did you see that switch in pronouns? We started out with plural, then we went to singular. Now we're back up to plural. Then shall men say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. And they went and served other gods and worshipped them gods, worshipped them gods whom they knew not and whom they had not given unto them, or whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. That was the oath that was being poured out upon them. But as I pointed out, and I point out to you again, the words of this oath were applied to the individual in the nation who might violate it. It was to them collectively and to them individually. And here's the point. The fall of any church or nation always begins with the individuals in it who think they can sin with impunity. It always starts with the individuals in it who think that they can sin with impunity. And one of the interesting things is that he describes this individual that thinks he can go serve other gods and go get plastered and have peace while he's doing it. He says to him, he says about that in verse 18, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And I want to compare that with Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, 15 and 16. Hebrews 12, 15 and 16. That is why people, any message we hear, we should always, always make personal application. Don't just hide in the crowd. Always make application to yourself. And so Paul tells us as believers in Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness 
That's just what he mentioned over here, the root and gall of bitterness. Springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be among you any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. See, notice that that corrupted individual becomes a root that corrupts others. He becomes a root of bitterness and of gall that has the effect of defiling others. The point being this, your personal sin affects more than just yourself. How many people have sinned with the idea that I'm only hurting me? No, no. You're hurting other people when you do that, especially when you're joined to others in the congregation of God. This is why, brethren, we have to practice church discipline. This is why when somebody like that comes to light, you've got to cut that individual out because if you don't and you leave them in there, it's going to affect the whole church. That's why the Bible tells us to be careful not to defile the temple of God. You may think you're getting by with it, but it is having an effect. It has, a, it, it, it has an effect, so you've got to cut that out. Otherwise, it will spread and affect the whole church. And you may wonder sometimes why I'm tough on things like church attendance. And while I don't think I'm an ogre and I don't think I'm unreasonable, I try to keep your feet to the fire and hold you to the line because I know what happens when that's not done. I know what happens. I pastored a church for seven years like that where I could not get that church to discipline people for not coming to church. We had people that literally lived practically around the corner that never even came, and they were kept on the books. And you know what that does? That breaks down the morale, because if they can get by with it, then other people that may be in a moment of weakness, then they think, oh, well, you know, what's the, what's the big deal, you know? So but they, they don't come, so why should I have to go? And it spreads until you have what I had with a great number of people that were very irregular in their attendance. It, it destroys the morale, and it puts a huge burden on the pastor. And boy, I'll tell you, when I left down there and I came here, if there was anything I determined in my heart, never again was I going to serve a congregation of people that were that indifferent about not coming to the house of God to give him his due. No more. I'd rather pastor 15 people that are dedicated than a, than a hundred where you got a bunch of people that it's not a matter of consequence to them. You say, you know, when I miss church, I feel, I'd always feel kind of bad about that. Good. So do I. Good. Keep feeling that way and you won't do it so much. <laughs> so do I. I don't know, when I go on a vacation, I don't know how you are, but when I go on vacation, I'll have a wonderful time, maybe miss a church. Sunday at church. I don't know why it is. I always, when I come back, I feel like I need a bath. I, why that is, I feel like I need a bath. And it's not that I did anything bad. But there's just, you know, there's just something cleansing about worship. There really is. Something about it. So anyway, but, but the point is, is that, that, that here this individual, you know, that is corrupted becomes a root to corrupt others. So you, you're, So what happened is this thing started individually and and in the nation, and, and the people around got indifferent to it and didn't do anything about it, and then it just spread, spread till the whole nation collapsed into this moral funk. And so while we're there, though, in Daniel, I thought this was kind of interesting. When you go back to Daniel 9, when you talk about the oath and the curse that was poured out upon them, I like this point, and it says that uh, in verse uh, 11... It said, uh, no, verse 12, And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us. One of the big problems you had in Israel is one of the big problems that you have in any nation that falls apart, and that is the want of justice. The want of justice. You go read the book of, if you get done with Deuteronomy 28, you think, well, what am I going to read now? Well, then go read Isaiah 59. And you, you talk about a corrupt society, and there's a thread that you can trace through there, and that is that this was a society that was wanting justice, a lack of the execution of justice. And the chapter closes out with the Lord's promise of his coming to execute the justice that wasn't being executed in the nation. 
because justice sooner or later will be served. It always will be. And if we don't do it, God will do it. And the thing that I find interesting, and, and when you read the prophets, they don't only just talk to the people, but there's a lot that they have to say to the leadership and to the judiciary. Because you see in Israel, the judges were not upholding the law. In other words, the judiciary had become corrupted. Imagine that. One of the biggest problems we face in our country is the want of justice. Oh, not the want of legal proceedings. We've got plenty of those. The court dockets are loaded. No, it's the want of justice. And one of the things you had happening there, and you have hap it happens time and again throughout history, and that is that you have a situation that you read about in Isaiah 20, 94 where it says mischief is framed by a law. And we have that word in Isaiah 10, 1, woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees. Not everything that's legal is right. You understand that? There's two different things. There's legality and there's justice and there's truth and there's righteousness. And of course, the standard of right and wrong ultimately is God. You get away from that, you start inventing a bunch of rules and regulations that really become oppressive and overstep the rights of what government have from God to do and overstep their bounds and you codify that and you judge people on the base of that and you make people criminal for things that aren't criminal. For example, a waitress that's struggling to make her ends meet that decides not to declare to the government all the tips she makes. If she gets found out, she is considered a criminal and grouped in with, because you know what that is, that's underground economy. And there is an underground economy, and there always has been, and you can pretty well chuck it up to this, the more oppressive government comes, the bigger the underground economy is. So you end up with a situation like you had in the days of Gideon where you've got people threshing wheat to hide it away from the Midianites because the Midianites were taking too much. You find people doing that. And there is an illegitimate underground economy like prostitution and drug trafficking, things like that. But isn't it interesting that maybe some guy that's a plumber that on the weekends is doing plumbing for somebody and taking money under the table gets classified in with pimps and drug lords. Like he's a criminal of the same ilk. When he is not, he's performing a legitimate service for someone. It is a private transaction and somewhere it seems to me in the Constitution it said we have the right to be secure in our papers and our effects. Somewhere it seems in there that we do have a right of privacy. And one of the things that I absolutely abhor about our modern tax system is that it's a gross violation of privacy. If two people contract together you will perform work for me. I will pay you. That's between us. That isn't anybody else's business but ours and the good Lord. And just because the government says they have a right to know, does that by God mean they have that right? They just assume they do. They just assume they do. And so you end up with people being fined and put in jail and thrown in with thugs of society that haven't done anything like those people have done, but are treated as though they were just that bad. But I'll tell you what, and, and, and so you can see the judges, the judges, and, and one of the things we have nowadays, sadly, is we have judicial legislation. The judges are making the law rather than upholding the law. But our forefathers saw the possibility of governments overextending their power to the point of becoming oppressive and abusing their power. They saw the possibility of that, and they put five checks and balances in our system as a remedy for that. Number one, the executive. The president can veto a law passed by Congress he thinks not fair. The Senate can refuse to pass a law they think not fair. The House of Representatives can refuse to pass a law they think not fair. Because for that thing to become law, it needs to go through the executive, the legislative, and the, uh, the uh, Senate, and the House of Representatives. Then there's a fourth tribunal, and that's the courts. 
they can, they, that law can be challenged in the courts, and the courts can decide this violates the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, and strike it down. But what if the courts uphold it? There is a fifth. There is a fifth, and it's called the jury. You know, when you have jury duty, you sit there as a judge. Now, in our system, one of the things that the courts have ruled, and I can show you it in case writing, is the jury can fly right in the face of the law and the facts and find the defendant innocent if they think the law is an unjust law. In other words, let's say you got that little waitress up there that didn't declare all her income, and there she is, trembling. She's a criminal. She didn't declare all her income. She did. She, she's this fraudulent criminal. She's sitting there trembling. And sure enough, law says she's supposed to tell all. That's the law. And the facts are she didn't tell all, and they caught her. So there she sits trembling. And the judge will tell the jury that you, your duty is to uphold the law of the state. That's your sworn duty. But he will also tell you, you must not vote against your conscience and against your opinion, your own personal judgment. You must vote your conscience and your personal judgment. So there you are. You look at that. You know what? I remember when I was a waitress. <laughs> you know you can find her not guilty, and there's not one thing the judge can do about that. You can fly right in the face of the law and the facts and thereby find the law unjust. Because sometimes, people, the problem is not with the person. It's with the law. Mischief framed by a law. It's the right of jury nullification. Don't you forget it. I preached a series on justice and judgment many years ago. You can go download it. You can go get the outline. I gave you the court cases. I showed you. Now, the judge won't tell you you have that right. That's been, the, the, the courts have said, he doesn't need to inform you you have that right because they're afraid the juries will get run away with it. <laughs> but I want you to know about it. So if you ever get jury duty, you just remember that. You think, you know, I know the guy did it, but I think this law stinks. Find him innocent. Let him go. The problem is now, people, Society is so dumbed down that the juries don't execute justice. They just follow along with whatever the media line is. Now, I'm not up here saying that you shouldn't declare all your income, but I'm saying if you don't, two things. I'm not going to consider you a criminal. And number two, just watch out. <laughs> now, you're not going to hear that down at your local mega church. That's a 501c3 corporation that needs to sing the government line. <clears throat> and here's the thing about it. Here's my take on underground economy. All that money get spent up into the overground economy, so at some level they're still getting their pound of flesh. In fact, uh, I think the underground economy, I read somewhere, or heard somewhere, it was huge in Russia. You know what fed Russia? It wasn't those collective farms, it was private gardens. It was actually essential to the survival of that rotting economy. Anyway, the point of it is, is you had a corrupted judiciary that was not upholding the law of God, though they would uphold the corrupt laws of men and the oppressive laws of men. So anyway, that's my, that's my little spiel on that. <laughs> you turn that into the IRS, I'll go to jail. You get another preacher. Oh, they, they turned me in for sedition. I told my tax man one time, I said, you know, the IRS has got to know there's an underground economy. He said, know it, they participate in it. 
they're all the time finding some congressman, some guy wants to run to president, and what do they do? They find out where he didn't declare something. He's got stuff soft offshore. You see, the guys that write those rules, they have the ways to navigate around them. So here's this, you know, multimillionaire, didn't have a tax liability. Now you tell me, how did he pull that off? <laughs> you yeah, know, they got their ways. So, we go back into this. Now we've had our little rabbit chasing. Let's get back to this. It is a righteous thing with God to fulfill his oath and to do what he said he would do. Because you see, he would have been unrighteous to do otherwise. Why is that? Because he said, you do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to punish you this way. If he didn't do it, he would have been unrighteous. He would have been true to his word. And here's the thing. Here's the ray of hope in all of that, and it's the one that Daniel is cashing in on. And that is, it is a righteous thing with God to fulfill his oath and to do what he said he would do. And if the Lord did not confirm his words of judgment for our sin, how could you trust him to confirm his words of forgiveness for our sins? Think about that. If he didn't confirm his words of judgment against our sins, how could you trust him to confirm his words of judgment or his words of forgiveness and promise? Oh, and before I leave that thing about the jury nullification, I forgot to give you a couple of things. That was something that was invoked during the slave days. When a slave would run away from his master, be hauled into court for breaking the law, and the juries would find him innocent. That was also done in the days of the prohibition when you couldn't have any alcohol. And then somebody got caught with alcohol and got it brought in, tried as a criminal, and the juries would let him go. <laughs> Probably because half of them had a drink the night before <laughs> and could not in good conscience send the man to his doom. So that prohibition thing just didn't work in this country, and it shouldn't have. Now, since righteousness belongeth unto God, the thing is, is that he never makes a mistake in anything he does. It says it belongs to him. Get that word belong. It means to go along with or accompany as an adjunct function or duty. To be the proper accompaniment, to be appropriate, to pertain to, to be the property or attribute of. It is appropriate for God. It is one of his attributes. It's his property to do right. And God is righteous. He's always right. Even when he permits us to suffer greatly, as was the case with Jerusalem, which had suffered an evil so great that it had been unparalleled in their history. Again, read the book of Lamentations. It had been unparalleled in their history. That's just what Daniel said. He said the Lord had brought upon them an evil a great evil. He said, for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done unto Jerusalem. Never in prior history had a nation suffered what they did at the hands of an angry God. And it was all stuff the Lord told them in advance they would suffer. So he was simply keeping his oath and confirming his words. In fact, in the book of Lamentations that I recommended to you in verse 17 of chapter 2, we read this. The Lord hath done that which he hath devised. He hath fulfilled the word that he hath commanded in the days of old. He's thrown down and hath not pitied. And he hath caused the enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversaries. So in this confession, notice Daniel started off by confessing their sin. Secondly, he confesses the judgment of God. And he says, God is right in what he's doing. In essence, the confession of Daniel amounts to this. Lord, you're right, we're wrong. Very simple. That's what it dissolves down to. And then in Ezra chapter 9, not only is he confessing the punishment but he's, that God has brought, righteously brought upon them, but coupled with that, Ezra's great confession in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 13. And again, I mean, an evil so great as unparalleled in history up to that point. No nation had ever suffered like that up to this point. And in Ezra 9, 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. 
Now, when you read the book of Lamentations, it's horrifying. The description of what they suffered is horrifying. And here Ezra comes in and says it's less than our iniquities deserved. So when you look at how bad it was, and it was less than our iniqu their iniquities deserved, what do you suppose their iniquities really deserved? Hell itself. And if you read the book of Lamentations, and you see there that that's less than what sin deserves, I'll tell you this, hell is one place you will not want to go, because it's worse. And it was bad for those 70 years, especially at the beginning when they invaded. Horrifying. They were besieged. There was no food. Pillaging, raping, starving, getting so bad that people were eating their own children to survive. That's how bad it was. And Ezra says that's less than we deserve. You know, he's got the right estimation of sin. He sees it for what it really is. And so an essential part of confession is not only, brethren, I'm teaching you how to confess and what to incorporate in a confession so that it's biblical, is not only the confession um, of the sin itself, but also the acknowledgement that it is God that is punishing the sin and he is right to do so. Psalm 51, 4, in this great hymn of conf a great psalm of confession, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, considering my sin, Lord, you're right to do anything you want to do to me about it. You're righteous. You see, people, whenever you have sinned and the hand of God is upon you for your sin and you're down there feeling sorry for yourself and, oh, this is so terrible and, 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 and I'm being picked on and people don't like me and yeah, 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 and these little self-pity parties, you don't get it. You haven't gotten it yet. Truth known, you don't think you deserve what you're getting. And you won't get where you need to till you come full circle on that one. And so Daniel's doing exactly what God told them in Leviticus 26, 40 and 41. We had a woman one time get up here. She was about to be excluded from the church. And I'll never forget her confession. She said this. Sadly, she didn't stay with it or she might have made it. She got up here and she said, I so deserve this. I so deserve this. In Leviticus 26, 40, he says, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them. See, not only do they confess they've walked contrary to God, but they confess that God's walked contrary to them. They confess what he's doing to them and that it's he doing it. And that I have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the punishment of my, thine, their iniquity, then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob. And on he goes. See, and that's what Daniel's doing. Daniel is accepting the punishment, humbly accepting the punishment and acknowledging it has come from the hand of God. Now, as we're talking about rights, let's talk about rights this morning. You hear so much about that, rights. What are our rights? What is this person's rights? Well, this chapter talks about rights. And first off, considering the magnitude of the sin of people, the people, the first right that Daniel invokes is the right of God. The right of God to be angry and the right of God to punish and punish severely. That's the first thing. You know, we'd all be better off if we'd think more about God's rights than our own. Daniel 9, and the, to the Lord belongs righteousness. Now let's talk about what, the, what belonged to the people. What was their right in all of this? <laughs> well, he tells you right there in verse 7, but unto us, here's what belongs to us, confusion of faces. That's what, that's what, that's what is appropriate for us. That's what's proper for us here. That's what belongs to us. This is our right in this deal. It belongs to us confusion of faces as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them. 
because of their trespass that they've trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. He asserts it again. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To them belong confusion of faces. Now let's define the term. We always do that. Confusion means mental discomfiture, which means mental discomposure, mental disconcertment, putting to shame. It is interesting in the Bible that confusion and shame get linked together. I'll give you three passages that show you the link between the two. In Psalm 35, 26, 35, 26, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Do you see the connection between the two, confusion and shame? Then look at Psalm 44, 15. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. And then Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 25. Jeremiah 3 and verse 25. Withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from first. When that's not the one I want. 325. I was reading 225. No wonder it didn't look like the verse. 325. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God and we and our fathers from our youth even unto this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Confusion and shame go together. Shame defines confusion. Now let's define shame. Shame is the painful emotion arising from the consciousness of something dishonoring, ridiculous, or indecorous in one's conduct. Like, like when you say something stupid and then you feel so ashamed. You think, why in the world would I say such a thing like that? Okay, in one's conduct or circumstances. Okay, we... So... Anyway, let's look at shame. It's that painful emotion arising from the consciousness of something dishonoring, ridiculous, or indecorous in one's own conduct or circumstances, or in those of others whose honor or disgrace one regards as one's own, like when your children do something terrible and then you feel ashamed because you're identified with them, or of being in a situation, or like if I, if I were out in the world and somebody out in the world was talking about one of you, and talking about what a bad person you are, then I would feel very ashamed because I'm identified with you. My honor is wrapped into yours and vice versa. And so it's a, it's a painful emotion arising from the consciousness of something dishonoring, ridiculous, or indecorous in one's own conduct or circumstances, or in those of others whose honor or disgrace one regards as one's own, or of being in a situation which offends one's sense of modesty or decency. Now notice he says to us belong confusion of face. You could see the shame in their faces. They felt and looked ashamed as well they should have. And this confusion of face was widespread throughout the nation as he said there in the chapter. He said to us belongs confusion of face. He said to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel, to all that are far, to all that are near. He went on down and talked about how it belonged to their princes, their kings, and their fathers. The shame, the confusion of face was widespread because their sin had been widespread. It belonged to their leaders as well as the rank and file of the nation. There was no person and no place in that nation that was not smitten with this shame. There was simply no getting away from it. Their sin had caught up with them. That's what happens when sin catches up with you. Then comes the shame. You thought you could hide it. Then finally God brought it out and now you've got the shame and the confusion of face. The, you can see it in the face. Why did I do that? How could I have done that? I knew better than that. How could I have been that stupid? Now I'm in this mess and what can I do now to get out of the mess I caused? confusion of face and to them and let me strive to drive this home belonged the confusion of the face the sense of shame properly belongs to sinners it is the appropriate response to sin and yet how many sinners will go to a psychologist a modern psychologist laden with the sense of shame for what they have done, and the psychologist, instead of going after the behavior that brought the shame, goes after the shame and tries to tell them they don't need to feel that way. 
Got it backwards. That's what, that's the proper response. And I want to say to every one of you in here, if you can feel confusion, and if you can feel shame for your sin, you thank Almighty God. Because I'm going to tell you something about people that don't feel that, and don't carry that sense. We're going somewhere with this, as we usually do. In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 5, I just want the last sentence after the word but, the contrasting conjunction but. I just want that last clause in verse 5. It screams out, the unjust knoweth no shame. So if you don't know or feel shame for your sin, that's an evidence you're an unjust person. Those who feel no shame for their sin will repeat it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. They will repeat it. Shame for sin is a healthy emotion. Not unhealthy, it's healthy. We read here in Jeremiah 3, 3, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead that refusest to be ashamed. Oh my God. Our culture is full of this. Massive, widespread whoremongering sex outside of marriage considered normal. I mean, we need to provide condoms in the schools because asking our young people to have sex is like asking them not to drink water. It's so normal, natural, they're going to do it. They need to learn how to protect themselves. Refusal to feel shame. That's where we are. That's where we are. And of course, the, the movies and the television shows are full of it. No shame. Chapter 3 and verse 5. Behold, the second part of the verse. Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. You did just as much evil as you could because you see you refused to be ashamed. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 where we read about unsaved Gentiles. We read about the heathen, the unsaved Gentiles. People whose understanding is darkened, who are alienated from the life of God because of the blindness of their heart. And look at how they're described in verse 19. I'm telling you people, be thankful you can feel confusion and shame for your sin. As long as you can feel that there's hope for you. And here he says in verse 8, 19, who being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness, which is are things inclined to lust, to work all uncleanness with greedy, uh, greediness, which is just a extreme degree of covetousness or lust. In other words, they give themselves over to their lusts, and as they do that, then they just lust more and more. Lust has a way of reinforcing itself. Once you get in, give into it, then you just want more and more until you become a slave to it. They're given over, delivered up. They give themselves to it. Somewhere back there, they faced a choice. The choice to resist or the choice to give in. And they gave in. And then it took over. And it took them. To where you have them right here. Who being past feeling of giving themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But observe how it describes them. Who being past feeling. When we define that word shame, we saw that it was a painful emotion. Shame is something you feel, people. It's a painful feeling, a painful emotion. But these people are past feeling. They do this stuff and they don't feel any shame. They've gotten past it. That is a terrible, dangerous thing to just do it and do it and do it until you don't even feel guilty about it anymore. And so because they feel no shame for it, they just give themselves over to it to just work all uncleanness with greediness. But you see, you don't want to be talked out of feeling that. Don't let anybody talk you out of feeling that. Don't let the media talk you out of that being an appropriate response for your sin because that's your safeguard to going back. I've taught you before in dealing with sin. Let yourself feel the shame. Now, you want to, it, need, it does at some point need to be resolved through the acceptance of God's forgiveness. But for a period of time, stay with it. Let it burn. Let it hurt. 
So you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10 through 11. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow is the shame and the sorrow you feel because you did it. The sorrow of the world is the shame you feel because you got caught. Any vile, hell-bound sinner can be sad he got caught. A child of God is sad he did it. A child of God is the one before he ever gets caught that looks back at what he's done and wants to bury his whole head in the sand that ever he could have been that foolish. And so notice what happened when they had this godly sorrow, how that works repentance, that works the change in your life. He said, for behold this self-same thing that you sorrow it after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. You see, once you feel that pain of shame, you'll be doubly careful not to go back there again because you don't want to suffer that pain. It hurts. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things you've approved yourself to be clear in this matter. I love that passage. It starts out with carefulness and it ends up with revenge. I'll tell you the day you'll overcome a weakness or a sin problem is when you get mad at yourself and you take vengeance on you instead of getting mad at the people that pointed the finger at you and say, you got the problem. I reminded you, you've got the problem. When you get mad at you and you determine to take vengeance on you and you say, I declare war on me, God help me, this is coming down. I'm not going to let this control my life like it has. Then you'll get somewhere. But shame is the appropriate response. And therefore, when you sin, let yourself feel the confusion and the shame for what you've done rather than trying to drown out that feeling in pleasure and drink and drugs and busyness or whatever else you might resort to or loud music or whatever you might resort to to try to drown out the shame you feel and facing it and dealing with it. In Ezekiel 36, 31 through 32, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. And not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Be ashamed, be confounded, be confused. Because the point is this. Remember what I told you. This is the pathway to gospel comfort. Admission of the sin, admission of God's righteousness and punishing it, and admission and owning, owning the shame that is the appropriate response is the pathway to the comfort of the gospel. If you're not ready for the comfort of the gospel, you've gone through that. And so it is, our Lord says, as he preached in the synagogue in Nazareth, one of the greatest sermons ever preached, but one of the shortest sermons ever preached in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the Son of God after he's just read from the prophecy of Isaiah because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. When you feel a shame for your sin that breaks your heart and leaves you feeling wasted, poor, you're ready to hear about the forgiveness through Jesus Christ for just such persons like you. It prepares you for the gospel. But brethren, let's bring it down to where we're living. It is precisely, it is precisely this sense of confusion and shame that our modern culture and media tirelessly endeavor to eradicate, eradicate. They want it gone. It's all over the place. And you're carrying in your pockets the pulpit that's preaching it.
constantly. Constantly endeavoring to eradicate this sense of confusion and shame. Instead, instead of shame for sin, people are encouraged to come out and affirm their sin as a vital part of their identity. This is who I am. And to feel good about it. They want to get rid of the shame because the shame is the safeguard against going back there. I mean, after all, I have my rights. We've been talking about that. Today. Yeah, you do have a right. Your right is to be ashamed of such abominable behavior. That's your right. Because if you remove, because here's the point, Pete, and, and, and you just see it. I mean, it's gotten to where now, every day, just about every day, you go to a news site. It's about some court case to legalize sodomites getting married. Yeah. Or it's about somebody that's come out. Now the other day it's a football player, supposed to be the quintessential machissimo male, comes out, teammates are understanding. Isn't this just wonderful now? You can be a queer football player. And of course, that just paves the way for more and more to come out and say, this is what I am. Do you realize, people, there was a day and time when that was against the law? It was in England until 1965. It was in this country. When you had a culture that was lined up against that, people still have the problem. Sadly, you don't always get to choose what tempts you. But if you had a struggle and if you had a temptation to that, the culture was lined up in such a way that you had an incentive not to yield. Now there's no incentive not to yield. It's been ripped away. And it's become socially acceptable. Or if you were a fornicating and you got pregnant out of wedlock, there was a whole culture that associated that with shame. Now, why, that's common. What's the birth rate of unmed, with unwed mothers? This is it's phenomenal. They've just, see, the whole culture is bent on attacking the shame, getting rid of the confusion. Now, let me tell you something. But I don't go out there. We deal with these people. And the more broken homes we have, the more affirmation of it in the culture you have, the more they're going to be out there and they're going to, you're going to be around them, you're going to mix and mingle with them, okay? I understand that. that. Sadly, this is where we are. I've seen these people. I've been around these people. I've dealt with these people. I don't spit on them. I don't yell at them. I don't call them names. I don't beat up on them. And I treat them with respect and courtesy just like I would anybody else. You know why? Because I look and say, but for the grace of God, there go I. But if they ask me, <laughs> I'm not going to invoke don't tell. And where I have a platform and a forum like I have here, I will speak to it. And I won't bat an eye to do it. And neither should you. You say, well, why would you treat somebody like that with any kindness at all? Because you never know when one day they might be visited with God's salvation. And I might be the man they look up. Because I would have you to know that Christianity was born in a culture that was imbued with this. Ancient Greece and Grecian culture. The Corinthians had been involved in it. Paul said, such were some of you. These people can repent. They can turn by the grace of God just like any of the rest of us. So it's like I've said before. On the one hand, I'm going to point the finger of accusation. On the other hand, I'm going to hold out the hand of forgiveness and repealing if there is repentance. And I'm not going to hold out that hand to somebody that's just going to be in my face flaunting it like they do in the streets. But here's the thing, people. If you remove the confusion of face that properly belongs to sin, you remove that, you still have something that doesn't change, and that is the righteousness of God standing arrayed against it. What are you going to do about that? I'll tell you what people do. They change their concept of God. They change the truth of God into a lie. That's how they handle it. 
Instead of them changing their behavior and their attitude, they change their concept of God to fit what they think is right and nice and good and just and fair. And, blah, 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 blah. and the reason I say that because that is just a bunch of idle babble. And so we read of just this very crowd in Romans 1.25 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And on down in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, a mind void of judgment, a judgment uninformed by truth. And so you come out, and instead of ugly words like fornication, let's change it now to uh, uh, sexual immorality. What's that? Well, we're pretty well open to define however you want to. We don't want to have sodomite in there. Oh, let's get rid of that. Uh, um, uh, what was it? Uh, shrine prostitutes. Whatever that's supposed to be. Well, I've already told you about that. But that's what people do. And here's what happens, people. When that concept of God gets changed around to fit the culture. The unrighteousness. Hold it. Hold it. The unrighteousness is now. The unrighteousness is now not the sin and the sinner. The unrighteousness has become condemning the sin in the sinner. Allah entre hate crimes. You got it. And here I am up on the internet spouting this stuff, just waiting for the day when they say people that preach that are guilty of hate crimes, sins against our culture, promoting hate. And then there I sit at the table with my attorney and you're in the jury box. This is time for jury nullification. That's why I'm teaching you this. I'm looking out for my hide. Yes, you bet. See how it's played? And I close on this point. That those who feel no confusion and shame for their sins now will feel it in the end. And that forever. That's why I say you be thankful you can feel it now. In Jude chapter 1, there being only one chapter, verses 14 and 15, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Here's the second coming to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the un all that are ungodly among them and all their, un all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I kind of get the impression these people aren't godly. <laughs> ungodly. Ungodly deeds. Ungod they, they, they're ungodly people doing ungodly deeds in an ungodly way. That's why they're ungodly sinners. Because I don't really know how to sin in a godly way, but yeah, that's, that's one. I'm just really stressing it. And all their hard speeches. All their hard speeches. Let me tell you, all these preachers of social justice and acceptance, and you know, love, and we shouldn't condemn, and we shouldn't judge, and blah, blah, blah. You get them going against the Bible and a man of God doing what I'm done today, and you'll hear some hard speeches. You'll hear some hard the venom will come out. Isaiah 45, I've heard it. Some of these atheists, oh, the vile blasphemy. Just horrible. Isaiah 45, 16 and 17. They shall be all shamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed or confounded world without end. I mean, thank God we will be delivered from eternal confusion and shame, but not the ungodly. That will be their portion. And then the last reference is Psalm 83 and verse 17. 83, 17. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. The ungodly who refuse to feel shame for their sin are merely postponing the inevitable. And if you can and do feel shame now, don't resist it. 
It's evidence you're not one of them. Amen.